Um, hi, I'm Miles. Um, it's really nice to have been welcomed here on NACE's behalf because at the moment I'm chair of NACE, which is great fun. I only get a year at that, but I'm having a lovely year doing it. My day job, though, is training the next generation of outstanding teachers at the University of Roehampton, which is a gorgeous job. I love absolutely every bit of that, apart from possibly the marking, although some of that's actually pretty good because the students do some really, really super work. I've been doing that for three and a half years now. Before that, I spent 18 years across four different schools most recently as a primary school head teacher. What I'm interested in is the parallels between our work, our craft, as teachers. Let me just do a quick show of hands, please. Former primary school head, I get to do this sort of thing. How many of you are actually teachers yourselves? Brilliant. I really am now very, very curious about what the other people do. Do I have any, like, computer scientists or software developers in the room? Uh-oh, okay, there are likely to be mistakes in this. You need to come and either heckle during or tell me afterwards what I got wrong about the agile bit of the title. I can do the pedagogy bit fine, although the rest of you may wish to disagree about that as well later. But the software development isn't my ballpark, okay? I do a little bit of HTML hacking, I run a few websites, I can kind of parse a bit of PHP code, and I teach trainees how to teach children to program in Scratch. But that's about the limit of my software development, so errors and omissions are expected here. Okay, come see me afterwards. Um, yeah, so what I'm interested in is the difference between our craft as teachers, this side of the room, and their craft as software developers, and the parallels and things that they have in common. So that's where we're heading over the next, we'll, we'll see, 40 minutes or so. I want to talk a little about pedagogy, tell you a little bit more about what we do at Roehampton, then look at the best, one of the best ways, of teaching children about computers, teaching children computing, and I think actually teaching children pretty much anything, so focusing really on one particular pedagogy there. Then we'll look at all three approaches to software development and some of the parallels into our world as teachers. So we'll look a little at waterfall, and we'll look a little at iterative development, and then I want to focus particularly for much of the rest of the hoop there on agile methods, getting into software craftsmanship, and then, you know, if we've got time at the end, I'm going to be shown a five-minute card, so by that point, with a bit of luck, there won't be any time left to talk about the elephant in the room or the weird sort of exhibition conference space about assessment. We'll see how we go, whether we get there or not. So let's firstly deal with this P word. Pedagogy has a bad reputation. People think it means telling children things. And, okay, that is actually part of the job description. We do that from time to time. But if you look at the etymology of this, etymology is the study of insects. No, that's something else. If you look at the etymology of this, it takes us back to the notion of the, the slave in the Greek household who took the child to the place where the learning happened. The pedagogue wasn't the teacher. The pedagogue was the household slave who accompanied the child to the place where learning happened. And I think that has a really important message for a lot of us in this line of work. Okay, so this is where I work. Well, actually, that's where our Vice Chancellor works. My office is made out of Breeze Block and some distance away from that. But we're at London's Campus University. And as I say, lovely, lovely place to work. Um, it's like a couple of other universities. It's a collegiate Institution. So we're made up of four constituent colleges, and I'm based in Froebel College. Froebel College, named after Friedrich Froebel, German educationist in the 19th century, who invented the kindergarten. And this is a 19th century German painting of a kindergarten. Now, any early years practitioners in the room? Okay. Would this pass its EYFS inspection? Touch and go. <laughs> okay. We've got I mean, the adult child ratio is all right. But, you know, they're not actually doing very much in terms of guided activity here. And yet learning is happening, isn't it? Because we have this hugely rich, stimulating, exciting environment that's set up for these children. And that's the place where the learning happens. And look at how much peer-to-peer -peer learning is going on. Look at how much creativity here is going on. Look at how much play is going on in a Froebel kindergarten. Froebel's renowned for one other thing as well, which is making these Froebel gifts. And the Froebel Gifts is a carefully structured sequence of oh, about 10 presents, 12 presents, which you give to children at particular stages in their early development. And this is one of the later ones. And it's obviously a collection of building blocks, yeah? And who got to play with things like this when they were growing up? As not enough of you. I'm disappointed with the crowd over there. Never mind. Who got to play with things like Lego, Meccano? Okay, these are important things. And we play with things like this down in the primary phase, down in early years. Why do we do that? So this is not an ideal environment for 
question and answer. But anybody would like to really shout out, why do we play with blocks like that down in kindergarten? Okay, well, is it because we want all our children to go up to be construction engineers or architects? Probably not, okay? Some will, but that's not why we put these things into their hands. We put things like this into their hands so they get to learn about how the world works. Conservation of number, conservation of volume, the properties of these shapes, the fact that if you drop one of them, gravity will act on it. So playing with toys like this teaches you how the world works. Okay, as I say, some children who play with this, like Frank Lloyd Wright, went to a Froebel kindergarten in the States. And, you know, some would argue that there are parallels between that early experience and his later work as an architect. I don't know. But they're not all going to become architects. Not every child who plays with Scratch in primary school is going to become a software developer. That's not the point. The point is that by playing with programming, by playing with toys like Scratch, tools like Scratch, they learn how the world works because computing teaches us about that as about so much else. Okay, so we go back to the beginning of this. Back, at, back in 1980, and he was doing work previous to this, we have Seymour Papert, who is really the godfather of computing in schools worldwide. And his vision for what, that, what children would learn through playing with these really powerful tools, these tools, the computers. Uh, okay, he was writing this in 1980, but how much of this is still true? In many schools today, the phrase computer-aided instruction means making the computer teach the child. One might say the computer is being used to program the child. In my vision, the child programs the computer, acquires a sense of mastery over a piece of the most modern and powerful technology, and an intimate contact with some of the deepest ideas from science, from maths, and from the art of intellectual model building. Isn't that what we want? Yeah? Not children sat in front of telly screens having learning objects built, beamed into their brains, but children taking charge of the machine and using that creatively, using that to get these deep ideas about all of the things that he talks about there. Later on, he coins this term constructionism. And okay, I'm a higher education teacher, training lecturer, I'm allowed to talk about learning theory. Um, and the word constructionism he uses to mean the way you learn. Papert was one of Piaget's students. We are in constructivist territory. Learning is about making a model of the world. But whereas Piaget says you do that for experiment, Papert goes further and says actually you do that best when you build something for other people to see. So at its heart, the best ICT lessons, the best computer science lessons are going to be those where the children are building things and building things for other people to see be they presentations, be they videos, be they programs. Sorry, that's um, Laurie Price's details coming up on screen. Okay, um, and we have here Ken Robinson talking about creativity and saying that for him, creativity is not just about originality, but it's about original, original ideas that have value, and that value is because the audience get to see those and the audience get to appreciate what you're doing. Back in 2007, D uh, Demos report, their space says, you know, look at what children can do. Look at what children, some children can do, but not all of them can. So by and large, most of the children you're working with are pretty good as information gatherers. Go and research about, they're going to type that into Google. They're going to go to the Wikipedia article and teach themselves about these things. They're good at staying in touch with one another. They're pretty good at keeping in touch. Facebook, MSN Messenger, occasionally email, I suppose, Blackberry Mail, uh, Blackberry Messenger, whatever. But look at the top two there. Generally, they're not as adept at those skills, about being creative producers, about being digital pioneers. And you know, Mars's one-line guide to teaching, it's one tweet guide to teaching, is meeting people where they are and taking them on to some place new. So meet them as information gatherers and everyday communicators, and then take them on as creative producers. And we come back to Papert and constructionism and Robinson and creativity there too. So what tools do you use? Well, these are some of the ones we use, some of the tools I use. Um, again, this is not a great venue for Q&A, but is there anything missing from this list? What would you include on this slide the next time round as tools for children to express their creativity when it comes to using a computer? Are there obvious things I've missed out there? Are there things you're surprised I've put in? PowerPoint? Of course! Making a presentation is a great way for a child to express their creativity, especially if it's for an audience, if they get a chance 
to present, and I worry that we focus too much on making the slides and not enough on how to present. You might think Mars needed some training on that too. Um, one of the lovely things I was doing last term was helping out with the British Computer Society the Royal Academy of Engineering submitting this draft of a programme of study for ICT to the Secretary of State to the Department for Education. And we were very, very keen to take that constructionist idea, that notion of we learn through building things and embed that within the curriculum. Kind of a little bit against the rules, because the curriculum has to be about what you should know rather than how you should learn it. But I think we might have got away with it. We'll see what comes back from the DFE when the thing gets published. But there, at Key Stage 1, about creating digital content. At Key Stage 2, about working collaboratively to create, test, evaluate a range of digital products. Key Stage 3, working creatively on individual and collaborative projects, blah, blah, blah. And even at Key Stage 4, where we very much trimmed back the content we were putting into the curriculum, exercise and develop their capability, creativity, and knowledge in digital media. So there at the heart of the new program of study, fingers crossed, touch plastic, um, is this, this notion that creativity has to be part of ICT education. We'll see whether we get away with it. Okay, so now on to some software development methodologies. This is what, anybody teaching um, ICT at A-level, computing at A-level? Okay, they're not interested in this talk. You are, um, some of the time. I'm told that you still have to teach waterfall methodologies if we come up with a list of requirements and you know th this this notion here those of you who are working in software in the real world will know that this method is tremendously efficient and effective and this is how we've got wonderful shining products like the nhs data base. never mind okay actually we've moved on from waterfall out in the real world haven't we okay and yet over in our line of work is this not how documents like this get written. You know, we come up with a set of, you know, a Secretary of State will come up with a list of requirements. Children should learn computing. That's what he said a year ago. Yeah, and it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. And then, you know, folks wearing suits meet together in rooms at the Royal Academy of Engineering or wherever and write, a, you know, design a curriculum to make those requirements happen. And then, of course, we have lower paid people who generally don't get much say in the process in software development. They're called programmers. In our world, they're called teachers whose responsibility it is to implement that curriculum design. And we do plenty of verification in our world. Oh, yes, testing is very much something which we do. And then once in a while, when we find out that it's not working like we thought it was going to do, we'll send out a service pack or a ring binder or some training materials and go, you know, just sort of tweak what's there. Okay, and of course, because that works very well for NHS databases, it's, it's going to work. Never mind with that argument. Okay, so that's where we were back in 99 with the old program study. There's still much that's good there. You'll see that there are very many points in common with the new program study. This is how things like GCSE exam specifications get written. Nothing wrong with either of these documents, please don't get me wrong. This then allows folk like Nick Gibb, the former school minister, to make statements like this, that, you know, all of this change, teachers get tired of this, don't they? Why don't we just get the curriculum right and then it can last a thousand glorious years? I will count it as a success when teachers are able actually to laminate their lesson plans and recycle them from September to September. Oh, wouldn't that make our lives easier? Why don't we do that? Why have we not just been teaching the same lesson plans over and over again? I ask this question where I can get answers from the audience, and people say, well, because the subject changes. And of course, in computing, in ICT, it does. Moore's Law, every year and a half, gets twice as good, it's twice as fast, twice as powerful. The primary teachers say, because they're different children. And that's why we can't laminate our lesson plans, because you're working with different people in front of you. It's not teaching computing, it's teaching children. So you end up with a curriculum which is very much cathedral-like, edifice there, there for the greater glory of, well, I'm not quite sure who, but it's, you know, done as well as we possibly can. People care about this and they want to get it right and they want to make it very, very good. Oh my gosh, I've got some of my trainees. I still think of you as students, but trainees there at the back of the room. They've heard it all before. Okay, so you've got this sort of cathedral-like edifice. There are other approaches. I mean, anybody remember Eric Raymond Cathedral in the Bazaar? Oh, it's a great, great essay. Do read it. So Raymond says this is how big software projects out in the commercial world get done. Over in open source land, it's much more bizarre. I'm sorry, much more like a bizarre. And, you know, we just put the tables out and we bring something of ourselves to the tables and we share what we can do and we borrow ideas from the places where we think they've got really good ideas. And do you not think that approach to curriculum design and this approach to curriculum design might actually 
you know, that one might actually work some of the time. And why have? You know, we've got this two-year period of disapplication of the national curriculum. We have then, if you're an academy, a free school, an independent school, you've got autonomy over your curriculum. You don't have to go to the cathedral. You can go and have a look what there is in the bazaar and take the bits that appeal to you and say, okay, I like that bit from the CAS curriculum and I like that bit from the NACE framework, but neither of them have got this bit right, so I'm going to write this myself and share that with an audience. And, you know, a wiki approach, an open source approach. Look at the Secretary of State's speech from a year ago. He uses these words. So a lot of open source software, a lot of the, way, you know, the software on your phones, the software which Google have on their servers gets written these days is not that waterfall approach. It's a much more iterative approach. So we plan, we come up with a list of requirements. We go through that loop, but we go, keep, go, keep going through this loop. You know, I show this to my trainees and they say, but like that's the planning cycle or the planning teaching assessment evaluation cycle. You'll see diagrams like this in almost all teacher training textbooks. Not about software development, but about the process of, okay, I plan my lesson, I teach my lesson, I assess the children, I evaluate my lesson, and then I replan my lesson. I don't laminate the lesson plans because I can always make it a better lesson the next time round. And you know, strong parallels there with the kindergarten learning cycle, throwable word here. Mitch Resnick, man behind Scratch, they're running the MIT's lifelong kindergarten group. Really, really nice parallels. And he says, this is how children learn in kindergarten. And is this not how we learn as teachers and how a lot of really good software gets written? Such as Scratch. Uh, this is an example from some of my year one trainees work from a couple of years ago. What they've got there is a gorgeous game. Okay, it's drill and practice maths. You'll see drill and practice maths elsewhere at BET today. But this is something they've coded up themselves. And isn't that better than going and buying a drill and practice maths program? Okay, it might not be as you know, shiny as some of the lovely stuff that's, that's around. But putting something of yourself into teaching resources is a lovely part of the job. It's what we do down in the primary phase. And again, you know, prescient stuff here that this is the best way to do drill and practice maths. It's not using drill and practice, it's getting children to write drill and practice maths. Okay, the font looks a bit weird on the screen. Anybody like to, sorry, again, Q&A is hard here. Anyone like to put a date on the quote? You have to shout out. Seymour Papert writing in 1971 when computers were really rather different to what computers are like today. But what, what an insight there. Okay, so moving on from the um, iterative stuff to let's look at this Agile stuff. Agile software development, it's, it's a vision, it's an approach to software that's really caught the imagination of a whole host of developers, especially in the sort of startup web to some of the game development space, the indie games particularly. So it's a fast way of getting things done, but it also works really well for, you know, some serious commercial products, projects, because you're directly and intimately connected with what the clients are interested in. They call them clients, we call them children. So they said, look, we found a better way of developing software. This is the Agile Software Manifesto. So yeah, process and tools, they matter, keep with that, but actually focus your attention on the individuals, focus your attention on your interaction with them. Concentrate not so much on the documentation, but on getting software that works, and that's got to matter more, surely, in most cases. Okay, contract negotiation, you're gonna to have to do, do this and deliver this, but actually working with your customers, clients, children, that's much more important than learning compacts and codes of behavior and so on. And yeah, have a plan, but be responsive to change. The trainees we have who get marked as outstanding as the one, are the ones who get are willing to move off the lesson plan when they're teaching a lesson because of what happens in the room. Now, if that's the case for software development, if the agile crowd have seen this is a better way, then don't we kind of get this too? Is this not on the left-hand side there what most of us see the best sort of teaching as? as focusing on the individual children, focusing on our interactions, as focusing on getting working knowledge, of collaborating with the children in our class, of being responsive to, the, to what happens in the lesson. And the stuff on the right-hand side, that's what senior leadership are interested in. We don't want to know about that. We want to get on and teach. Thank you very much. And okay, Ofsted are interested in that sort of thing too, perhaps. But over on the left-hand side is where the fun of it is. He speaks as a former head teacher. Here. 
And then they come up with lists of principles. So this is in too tiny a font even for the people at the front of the room to see. But you can Google this, uh, Google principles of agile development. And you get things like this. And I think each one of these 12 things has a direct analog over in the world of teaching. So you can take any one of those. Simplicity. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. Good for software development, good too for us. Focus on what matters in the lesson. Concentrate all of your attention on the learning, not on all of the other stuff and the paperwork and so on. And then you get other nice parallels there as well. So, for instance, you've got uh, you know, this notion of pair programming, which is an agile methodology, where it seems that this, there's evidence to suggest that two programmers working together on one screen, one keyboard, one mouse between them is much more efficient than two people working separately on two separate screens and then trying to join things together afterwards. Is this not the case in school as well? How many of you are working in ICT suites where the children have to share a computer? That's a change for the better. Okay, just one or two of you. But make a virtue of it, yeah? Two children being able to share a computer between them, what a wonderful opportunity for one of them to take the navigator, the other one to take the driver type role and do this sort of pair programming or pair development work between them. And what about for us as teachers? Working with a colleague in a parallel class, working together on developing resources, developing schemes of work, isn't that much more efficient, effective, worthwhile? than just doing everybody doing their own work independently and so on. Then you get this notion of the scrum. So again, agile approach. So the notion is that the team who are working on the software project meet together daily and somebody controls those meetings. And in the meetings, there are only three questions addressed. Nothing else matters. What have you done since the last scrum? What will you do between now and the next scrum? And what's stopping you getting on with this? Why not do staff meetings this way? Why not do department meetings this way? Why not do plenaries in your lesson this way? Are these not ideas that we can apply in our context too? Oh yeah, and there's one, staff meetings. Team members should not digress beyond answering these three questions into issues, designs, discussions of problems, or gossip. There you go. <laughs> okay, and again, sort of tips about agile development, pragmatic programming. These apply to them, they apply to us too. You can take each of these ideas and think, how does this work in our, in our context? I love the last stuff. Do I have to do it this way? Yes, because you're told to. Does it have to be done at all? Concentrate on what matters. Get working software, get working knowledge. Don't worry about the other stuff. Oh, and rely only on reliable things. There's a really, really important lesson there. Okay, and then of course we move into sort of more meta territory. One of the reasons why we're interested in teaching all of this computer science, all of this programming stuff, is because it gets children to think about the world differently. Those of you, oops, and cables here. Those of you who put your hands up for I'm a coder, I'm a software developer, do you not think that you think about the world differently from your friends, that you see problems in a different sort of way? Maybe, maybe not. Not getting in. Oh, somebody's nodding. Thank you very much for the nod there. Yeah? And those of us who kind of get a little bit of computer science, who've got the idea and find ourselves working in school, how many of us get really frustrated when school leadership or others come up with a way of solving the problem when they've really not thought about it in computing, I'm getting a very knowing nod from the front here, yeah? These techniques, if more people understood these ideas and ended up as head teachers of school leadership, then I suspect schools would be run much more efficiently and effectively, yeah? Breaking problems down into manageable chunks, looking for the patterns, thinking about the most efficient way to solve these problems. Okay, and of course then you get to the notion of the pattern of the reusable ideas, the reusable code. And of course you've got a lot of this happening in your lesson planning, in your design of a learning episode, or the design of a lesson, there are patterns we draw on here. So this is an idea borrowed from the domain of architecture. Alexander talking about a pattern language. What's the best way to build a town? Loads of town planners, loads of architects have to solve pretty much the same problem. There should be optimal best ways of doing this. Let's see what those patterns are and see how they can apply. And of course, the object-oriented programming crowd really took this idea to heart and came up with some brilliant ways of applying that to object-oriented programming, of what are the patterns, how can we apply those generally. And then other people have taken pattern language ideas and applied them in other contexts. So Huvanosh and I talk about apprenticeship patterns. What are the, what's the pattern language for learning to be a software developer? And these are some of the things which they say, you know, so you know, find your mentors, learn your first language, use the source. Um, this process of apprenticeship to becoming a software developer 
from my point of view as a teacher trainer, I think there are strong parallels between that and the process of becoming a teacher. So I reckon, you know, you could take a number of these patterns for software development apprenticeship and apply those in the teacher training context too. So, you know, yes, nurture your passion. Find the thing you really love about the job and make that at the heart of what you do so much in the classroom, in school. And yeah, be willing to expose and confront your ignorance. Find the kindred spirits. And just as for software developers, the web makes that easy. Similarly for us as teachers, we can look beyond our own staff room and find the kindred spirits elsewhere. Oh, we just missed a little bit of there. Okay, let me just, I think it's supposed to go. For some reason, my PowerPoint presentation thing here doesn't want to show you the picture of the Secretary of State. Somebody been at this computer. Okay, here we go. And that is why we will reform teacher training to shift training teachers to increasingly out of college and into the classroom. Teaching is a craft, and it is best learned as an apprentice, observe a master craftsman all. Watching others and being rigorously observing yourself as you develop is the best route to acquiring mastery in the classroom. Now, there are many in my line of work who take issue with that, but, you know, that was one of his, oh no, it's all gone horribly wrong. Okay, present, and then sort of click somewhere around there. We're back on track. Okay, um, there are many who take issue with that approach to teacher training, but actually there is something there that much of the time it is a set of craft skills that we're acquiring, and the best way to acquire craft skills may well be through being apprenticed to the master craftsman. The issue, of course, is finding those master craftsmen and making sure that they take responsibility, just as the masters in the medieval guilds would have done for bringing on the apprentices, the next generation. Diana Lorillard writes about this far more eloquently than I could have ever done. I want to grow up to be Diana Lorillard. You have here this notion that teaching is a craft, teaching is a design science. The imperative for teaching is that, the, is that the learners develop their personal knowledge and capabilities. It is craft because you're focused on delivering value to your customers, clients. So once is enough, there you go. And uh, Richard Stallman talks about much the same thing as one of the, this is the, the hero of the free software movement, the man who did everything other than Linux in uh, the Linux operating system, um, talks about, uh, you know, programming is a craft. It's not so much the art of programming, as Donald Knuth says, but it's a craft because you're making objects that are useful for other people. Yes, beauty matters, but utility matters much, much more. And then Senate talking about craftsmanship in general. Is this not true of computing? That we fix by fixing things, by debugging our code, by getting our programs working properly, that's how we come to understand how they work. Again, parallel to our type of craft, why has this child not got this? Why has nobody in my class got this? By fixing those things, that's how we come to understand how teaching works, how education, how learning works. Okay, so a little bit about craft there, which naturally takes me on to the notion of software craftsmanship, which grew out of agile development. So this takes things a stage further. You'll see that they start from agile development, working software responsiveness to change individuals and interactions, customer collaboration, but go further than that. They say, yeah, have working software, but have well-crafted software, that having software that's good as well as working matters. And this is what craftsmanship is about, not just utility, the utility that's well-crafted. And, you know, yes, be responsive to change, but it's not just what the client says that goes. You need to add value. And so, yes, by all means, Roehampton lecturer here, you know, learner-centered education matters, but you're also there to teach the children, to take them on to something which they couldn't do beforehand. You're adding value to them, yeah? And yes, focus on the children in front of you, your interactions with them, but never forget you're part of a community of practice here. We're part of a community of professionals and we share what we do with one another. Collaborate with your children, collaborate with your customers, but also focus on the productive partnerships of working with other people to get make things better than they would otherwise have been. Good Rosh and I again from Apprenticeship Patterns, primarily building something that serves the needs of others, not indulging in artistic expression. And Diana Lorillard in the same book makes the same points. Again, you know, building on the work of others, part of this community of practice, representing and sharing our pedagogical practice. She is an enthusiast for pedagogical patterns, the outcomes they achieve and how these relate to the elements of their design. So that's something we share with 
one another. And Lorillard is arguing that we need a language to be able to describe that. TS website, Guardian Network, other places, great, NACE, of course, great way of sharing these ideas with the community of one another. And that takes us to sort of notions of community practice, that it's, this is a social learning process, that we have there this notion of learning through doing and learning through making meaning. But the top stuff matters too. It's taking on this identity as a teacher and also participating in this community, this learning as a sense of belonging. Oh dear, I've got to the elephant in the room a little too early. We may finish a bit earlier, that's right. <laughs> We're doing all right. So the elephant in the room, the assessment stuff. All of this sounds all well and good, but what happens about GCSEs? Not just computer science now on the GCSE, um, the EBAC list. And what happens when it comes to getting them through their A-levels? Do we forget all about these agile craftsmanship approaches to teaching and just give them the worksheet and teach them the test? I hope not. There are interesting approaches around that. Let's not worry so much about the GCSE grade or the A-level grade. Let's worry about recognizing, or let's focus on recognizing individual achievements. And so anybody here in the Scouts, Guides, Cubs, Brownies, been in the Scouts, Guides, Cubs, Brownies? Two people, there must be more than that, that's good. So you have the notion of the badges. You do something, you get the badge for it. And isn't this a more helpful way of thinking about assessment. Don't tell me what your grade was. Tell me about the things you can do. This is the stuff, the information that matters. And you get this sort of badge thing elsewhere too. So you know, this is developer community called Stack Overflow where you share your problems and other people come in and say, this is how you solve it. And you get badges for being helpful in there. These are the gold badges, which you've got to be really good in order to get. You know, there are only 574 editors, copy editor badges out there because there's, uh, you've got to get one of those, you've got to edit 500 other posts. So, you know, to get these badges, you've got to be pretty good at your stuff and, you know, pretty committed to the community. But it's a way of recognizing that, it, that achievement. And, you know, you want a job as a software developer, your profile on Stack Overflow, what you've contributed to, what you've helped people about, that's something that's going to matter, and that's available for children too. So people are taking that idea and applying it down in our context too. This is uh, Chris Allen, whose Twitter handle I've forgotten, but he's come up with this notion of the digital badges. So for the children in his school, he's awarding them with these little digital badges when they may achieve particular things. So I can work in Kodu, you get the Kodu badge to put on your learning platform, to put on your blog. You know, I'm able to be a digital, digitally creative person, I'm a digitally literate person. You have the sort of skills and then competences and then literacies. Uh, Chris is still thinking in terms of the sort of national curriculum levels, which I know we're moving away from in the new framework. And then our friends at Mozilla, the people who brought you Firefox, have got the whole back office infrastructure for this ready to go. This thing called Open Badges, and what you have here is on one of their servers, you know, probably a collection of servers, somewhere you've got the infrastructure to run this. So you, as a teacher, as a school, as a local authority, as a regional broadband consortium, can certify badges. These children have achieved these things. Mozilla say, okay, this particular individual has achieved this particular competency from this particular organization. And then the little badge becomes a clickable thing with metadata attached. You put that on your digital CV, employer clicks on that and finds the evidence to support that judgment, that claim that you're making. A replacement for GCSEs and A-levels? I don't know, but maybe not just yet, but jolly useful information if somebody's looking for a job or a place at a Russell Group University, I'd have thought. Talking of which, what's going to get you that place, the job in the industry, or the place on the CS course at the Russell Group University more? Your GCSE grades, your A-level grades, or the fact that you participated in Young Rewired State and produced some brilliant web-based app which took open government data and made it useful for a whole host of people. What's going to matter more, your GCSE grades or that you've contributed to open source projects through Google's Coding, which is like Summer of Code for high school students? What's going to matter more, the fact that you've got a good GCSE grade or the fact that you've got apps out there on the iPhone, iOS store? It's no longer, I think, about the qualifications. It's much more about the people you've worked with, the projects you've worked on, and the portfolio of work which you can show off. Even at, sorry, I shouldn't say even at Roehampton, at Roehampton, 
for a teacher training course, we don't offer the places on the basis of A-level results. Okay, you've got to get a certain number of points, but you don't even get the offer unless you can say what work you've done with children. We are interested in the portfolio of evidence of how you are obviously committed to teaching before you start sign up for a three-year course training to be a teacher. Um, so if ours, then other places too. This is how you get from Roehampton to Excel. I started at Roehampton. I've ended at Excel. We have here a very linear journey. This is obviously produced by Google satellites and computers and all of that. And that's fine. This is jolly useful information. I want to get from point A to point B. This is the way to do it. This is how we think about curriculum. Yeah? This is where the learners are. This is where we want them to get. Or this is possibly in a more child-centered way. This is where they want to get. And we have the most efficient route to get there. All well and good. There are other interesting places on this map. And there's much more of London to learn about than just getting to the Excel Center, believe it or not, folks. Okay? Isn't there a place to explore here? Think about learning not so much as a journey. Think about learning much more as a landscape to explore. So over on the left-hand side, we use these metaphors a lot. We think of our lessons in terms of the time. You know, on the Roehampton lesson planning sheet, we have the back page, which you love filling in, don't you? Where it's, what do you do in each minute of the lesson? Okay, in each chunk of the lesson. Okay, we think of learning as a journey. You use that metaphor a lot. We think of learning takes place in the lesson in the classroom. We record the evidence in the blog. We show films, we show videos. That's great, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. We assess in terms of levels. Our IT rooms, don't they just look a lot like call centers? IT room in your school, call center? Passing similarity? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. And we think about programming in terms of procedures. The language on the right is just or is valid. Okay. Think in terms of temporal metaphors and linear metaphors in terms of spatial metaphors. You've got three dimensions, possibly more, out there, folks. Come to Brian Cox's talk tomorrow. Think of learning as a landscape to explore. Think about how much of your learning took place not in lessons or lectures, but in the library or the great online library that we call the, the web. And why do we focus so much on children blogging? Well, there's another great web tool, to, web two tool out there, the wiki, of looking at the connections, of making something together rather than making something on our own. Yeah, film is great, but games are great too. And don't assess so much in terms of level, 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 level. But badge for this, badge for that, badge for the other. And okay, make your IT suite if you have say in these matters. A little more like a design studio and a little less like a call center. And okay, I'm into territory I don't really understand here, but Objects First has a lot to recommend it. It's a different way of thinking about how computers work, I'm told. If you want to get in, I'm going to hang around. I've got, you're supposed to show me my five minute sheet now. Okay, okay. I'm going to hang around for about five minutes. Um, there's an email address up on the screen, there's a Twitter thingy, and there's a blog which I'm going to try and start writing more for. It's hard to sort of keep blogging, I, I don't know. Um, if you want to see these slides over again, and I don't know why anybody would, then there's a bit the link which should take you back to the Prezi. Thank you very much for your patience this morning. <laughs>